Uh, I was just mentioning it's so good to be back. Uh, two Sundays ago when Ted was teaching, um, Janie and I were spending uh, about a week with her 97-year-old mother up in Minnesota, and uh, we're surprised to be, we took her to church, and she was celebrated at the church. They had planned this, and we didn't know. Uh, celebrated as the volunteer of the year for the Covenant Church of North America. Um, and uh, she certainly has been a faithful servant of the Lord, and it was just so awesome to share that time with her. And then we went on from there to Virginia and met our new, at that point, three-week-old grandson. So we go cover the extremes, you know. Yeah. It's good. But we miss being with you. I don't know. We're, gonna, we're working on this being multiple places at one time, and I'll share the secrets as soon as we figure them out. Um, oh, in between all that, I also had two cataract surgeries. So excuse me. I hope I don't distract you by this on and off of these little reader things because this always seems pompous to me <laughs> to look over the lenses at people. And so I take them off because I can't, but I need to put them on to read again. So anyway, we, we will get through it. And, uh, yeah, um, but I, I hope that you two are really being blessed and challenged by this study of Isaiah. It's a, you know, as we were talking, it's a, it's a very challenging book and, uh, uh, I always want to kind of sort it out and make everything chronological and be clear about what's now, what's soon, what's in the distant future, what's in phases, all this stuff. I just need to take it as it is and try to understand it. But um, this book is really helpful. Yes, sir. Don't mind my dress code. I just got it off. Oh, well. I usually dress up. Your, your dress is perfectly fine with everybody in this room. So we're glad you're here. Thanks for doing that. So we are today going to delve into chapters 9 and 10 of Isaiah. But before we do that, and before we pray, I just am wondering if there's something from the discussion last week. Uh, Justin facilitated a discussion that went into chapter 8. If there's something from that that's been kind of bouncing around in your mind, your head, your heart um, over, the last, uh, over the last week. Anything that's st stuck with you? I know I look back at, you know, I've studied it uh, previously and then last week, and there were two things that really jumped out at me from last week's lesson, and I'm sure this was covered. But if you turn to Isaiah chapter 8, uh, in verses 11 through the beginning of verse 14, Isaiah says, The Lord spoke to me with his strong hand upon me, warning me not to follow the way of this people. And I think it's, uh, it's a good warning for the present day for us to take the heart, not to be sucked into following the way of the people. And then he gets more specific. He says, do not call conspiracy everything that these people call conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear and do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear, he is the one you are to dread, and he will be your sanctuary. I think we could just go back and park on those couple of verses for the next hour, but I just want to bring them up again. I appreciate uh, the commentary at the end of that uh -huh. lesson. He said he did not simply 
talked about the Old Testament prophets. He did not simply let the consequences fall on each generation. Instead, he sent prophets in each generation to tell how well he thought the people were living up to the covenant and how he planned to respond. Mm -hmm. The nation was disobedient and they were sent back. He warned them yeah. that the agreed results were going to occur in those 30 days. Yep. Oh, that's so good. And just remember that because we're going to be coming back to that in about a half hour. <laughs> um, so that that passage, I think there are these these morsels that are timeless that we just want to hold on to. And this one seems so appropriate to the to the days, to the times. I was um, when I was meeting our three week old grandson, his father, my son, is a conspiracy theorist. And every conversation gets into some conspiracy about one thing or another. And I always talked to him, I just said, well, where does this lead you? What does thinking and living and engaging like this do to your heart and mind? And th this, these verses just kept resonating with me. Do not call conspiracy what other people kind of delve into these conspiracies. Do not fear what they fear. And of course, we, we all think about that verse from Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so anyway, we're not here to uh, study chapter eight, but that was just, those were so powerful to me. I just want to root us there before we go on into uh, chapters nine and 10. And, like all the rest of the book of Isaiah, the writer is always bouncing around in time and in place. And so it can be a little confusing, but we'll try to, to work our way through that a bit this morning. So before we uh, get into chapter 9, who would open us in prayer? Asking that our hearts and our minds would be engaged and sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Okay. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, uh, we uh, desire to learn from you, to learn from you. I pray that you will open our minds and hearts to this, and speak more David, and uh, help us to learn more about you, Lord. Help us to learn from Isaiah. And, uh, David said, it, it, it's complicated, but through your Holy Spirit, help us to rightly divide the word of truth. And may we apply to our hearts and to our life in Jesus' name. Pray. Amen. 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 Okay, who would tell me what the first word is in Isaiah 9, verse 1? Nevertheless. Nevertheless. Well, what does that mean? That means we have to look back, just a little bit at least. And if we look back at where you ended last week, um, it's talking about people that have been willingly led astray. It says, um, when men tell you to consult, this is verse uh, 19, when men tell you to consult mediums and spiritists, to whisper and mutter, should not a people instead inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? But no, rather to the law and to the testimony. What's the law and testimony? It's scripture, right? To the law and testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, the law and testimony, they have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged and looked upward. They will curse their king and their God. Then they will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and they will be thrust into utter darkness. So that's about as terrible a set of circumstances that people can live in as is imaginable. So he says, but nevertheless, despite this, there's hope. 
There will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by way of the sea along the Jordan. Now, most of us have these headings, section headings in our Bibles, and uh, that kind of gives us a clue sometimes as to what's going on. And mine says, to us, a child is born. And so we know that there is hope coming. And why it says that those in distress will see a great light. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee. Now listen to these words. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun, and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet, who? Isaiah. And then it quotes from the prophet Isaiah. So sometimes we wonder uh, how much is being fulfilled at what point when we're reading through Isaiah. But here it's quoted right from the book of Isaiah how Jesus in his life, in his decisions, in his responses to the circumstances of his life, how he was fulfilling prophecy that had been made over 700 years earlier. So it's a direct quote from this section of Isaiah chapter 9. And of course, Jesus was very much aware of the fact that he was fulfilling these prophecies and that when God spoke things like this through Isaiah and through other prophets, these prophecies were about him. And that's why he could make the audacious claims he made for himself uh, throughout the Gospels. So uh, it's a stunning verse and an amazing way to begin uh, this chapter 9. And then we come into a series of verses that are quite familiar with to us and uh, are often quoted as part of the Messiah or part of our Christmas uh, celebrations because they are prophecies about the coming of our Messiah. Um, who would read... Um, the first five verses, or I mean two through five of Isaiah. Okay, Hetty. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has come. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's suit used in battle, and every garment rolled in blood, will be destined for burning, will be fuel. Okay, now there's a lot here that we're not going to be able to dig into much this morning, but even just the way it's expressed. I don't know if you get this sense. If you go back to the part we read just before, nevertheless, you realize the darkness and despair and dysfunction that people were living in. And then it, this promise that, they, that the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned. 
and it has given them cause for joy. It just shows the the power. It's the it's the light and dark alternatives of the kingdom. And so it it has there there's all these little elements to it that are each worth more study. Like in verse four, it says, "For as in, as in the day of Midian's defeat." Well, if you were an uh, an Israelite, a Hebrew, and you heard these words, Midian, through the centuries, was a huge enemy of and massive thorn in the side of Israel. Over and over, the Midianites afflicted them, conquered them, abused them, oppressed them, enslaved them. And a number of times through history, God chose by his power to deliver them from the Midianites. And one of them was when Moses was reigning. And so when it says, for as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. These were things that they could feel viscerally, what it meant to be delivered. And here was Isaiah under the Holy Spirit's power and direction, telling them that the same kind of relief, the same kind of hope, the same kind of deliverance was coming to them. Incredible process. Who are the Midianites? Who were they? Are they people who existed? Are well, they were, they were a people group uh, right near uh, Israel, and they were just arch enemies. And Israel, as I said, kept being conquered by them. Israel disobeyed God and at some points began to worship the, the gods of the idols of the Midianites, which profoundly offended the Lord. So there was this constant off and on. And people groups still exist. They just have different forms and different names. It's a whole big discussion that um, I would rather not spend our time on since there's such richness in other parts of this chapter. But it is, it is important. Now, tell me this verse 5 where it says, Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning will be fuel for the fire. Why is that? Anybody have any idea why? Yes, Mark. Well, eventually, the trial will establish the seed. Exactly. Yes, so all the things that are vestiges. In the past, part of the plunder of these battles that people would get is they would get the boots of the, the warriors that had fallen. Those were really precious. And he's saying none of that, all of that's going to be fuel for the fire because none of that will be needed because there will be war no more. Then we come into this very familiar kind of Christmas passage. And I'm wondering if someone would read um, verses 6 and 7 of Isaiah chapter 9. Yes, Kathy. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. Government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Okay, now I just want to invite us to pause for a second and 
not listen to these verses the way we always share them and hear them, especially as I mentioned around Christmas or as we listen to the Messiah, um, the, the music, the Messiah. Um, but think about them as the hearers heard this verse. You know, I've often felt judgmental about um, the Hebrew people, Jewish people, that have not seen or have rejected Jesus as the Messiah. But I want us to stop for a minute and think about these verses the way they would have heard them and think about this issue for just a minute. So what would uh, the hearers, what would their expectations? We can't, just putting aside the fact now that uh, almost 3,000 years later, a lot has happened and we shape our views based on what has happened. For the hearers at the time, what were their expectations of this child that was born, this son that was to be given for them? Be king, bring peace. Okay, be king and bring peace. I can see where they would take that as, it's going to be our king. Yep. It's going to be the conqueror. Yeah. Yep. Mark? Okay, same thing. <clears throat> All right, so... Yeah, there's this whole narrative around the expectations based on this passage. And it's pretty, well, let's just pause for a second. Uh, we believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that he came in full, partial, for this time, partial fulfillment of this prophecy. Um, did Jesus, has the, the time that Jesus has spent on the earth, how did that fulfill this prophecy? Did it? Did he? Yeah, in the eyes of the hearers at the time and just objectively. Jesus came. We believe his coming was, uh, that time was at least a beginning fulfillment of these verses. So the expectations that, that people had based on what the verses said, did Jesus fulfill them? What's that? Okay. Yes. Okay, yep, and that's a key thing we're going to get right back to. Anything else? That Any other reactions? I think my, uh, my mind is you were asking the question is that just as the, uh, the poor of Israel are, and they do tend to be a very physical, uh, you know, touch, Mm -hmm. uh, people, but Jesus came not to abolish, but to fulfill, and he brought a, a greater consciousness to the spiritual realm that sometimes we still probably seek. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's the spiritual that we are contemplating. Okay. Turn with me, if you would, to John chapter 18. And let's look for just a minute at verse 36. And Jesus is being questioned in this passage by Pilate. And we're not going to uh, go through all of the questioning, but in verse 36, uh, in response to a question from Pilate, Jesus says, My kingdom is not of this world. 
If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews, but now my kingdom is from another place. So when we look at these questions, how did Jesus fulfill these expectations that uh, the increase of his government and peace, there would be no end. Um, he would establish and uphold his kingdom from David's throne. Um, yes, Mark. <clears throat> Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And over and over they would ask questions like, well, when, when are you going to, yeah, yeah, we want to be on the right hand and left side. When are you going to, you know, make it happen? We're waiting. You know, Simon uh, the Zealot. Uh, had particular struggles waiting, and Judas as well. Part of his issue was he was waiting for the fulfillment of these other promises, the promises of Isaiah. Just a second. So if the words of Jesus are, are the ones we focus on, my kingdom is not of this world, then when we look at it that way, this, this is going where Jane was going. How... How did Jesus, in his earthly life there, his ministry for especially those three years, how did he fulfill these promises? He overcame the world. Okay, ultimately he did, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think the wonderful counselor and person, those are things that he did do while he was here mm -hmm. on earth. You know, he was the good counselor and he was able to, um, mm -hmm. they were able to minister and help him yeah. physically and emotionally. Yeah. And again, remember that verse, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. So even his peace is of a different order than the peace that people were, were expecting. So the increase of his government and his peace, well, one way that he accomplished it was he extended this hope to the Gentiles. That vastly expanded the, the territory, the, the peoples over which he reigned. Um, when it, it says he would shatter the yoke and break the rod, if we uh, just flip back a little bit to Luke chapter 7. And look at verses 18. Through 23. Bless you. Uh, even 20. When the men came to Jesus, these were men sent by John the Baptist to inquire. Uh, when the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? It's that same core question. At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. So... The, this idea of increasing his government and peace, shattering the yoke and breaking the rod, uh, reigning on David's throne with justice forever. A lot of that was fulfilled or put in place 
uh, during the time that Jesus uh, walked on the earth. And of course, we know and believe that the ultimate fulfillment of all of this uh, is yet to come with Christ's return. Now, I just want to read again uh, from chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, and ask you to think about this. This is a question out of our book, and I think it's really uh, very helpful. Which of these seem most important to you, and why? So just listen as I read and think about that, uh, those questions for these two verses. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Which of those elements seem most important to you personally and why? That he will reign. And why? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, Jesus obviously has already accomplished uh, our, what's necessary for our salvation and for eternal life for us, but it is the, it's the, full, it's the fullness mm-hmm. of all of that that we look forward to. Ted? That phrase, uh, the, uh, unto us a son is given. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, uh, obviously, Christ fulfilled the Father's will and that gave himself. So, that act, the Father raising him, everything, but then there's the other aspect of it's given to us, it's Christ in us. So, uh, he's not come back yet. Mm-hmm. We're all living in a sinful world. Mm-hmm. We have victory in him. Mm-hmm. And so, to me, that's Mm-hmm. So important. Because when I get to heaven, it's always confusing. <laughs> yeah. Can't go on up there. Yep. Yep. Other parts. What what really strikes you? You just something in you just longs for that particular dimension of it to be fulfilled. Yes. Everlasting Father. Everlasting Father. Not temporary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, what strikes me is that that is really a, a wonderful counselor. Mm-hmm. So we should be every day seeking counsel before we jump off the cliff. Mm-hmm. You know, every hindsight's always twenty. Every yeah. insight. Yeah. So let's stop having hindsight. Right. Yep. 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 David, one last thing that last <laughs> the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, there's nothing what more powerful than that. Yeah. He who made the earth, who made the heavens, who made the sun. There's no power like that. Yeah. Infinite power. We have no doubt. Yep. So I think everybody would agree that these these elements are what we most deeply long for. You know, we live in a broken, unjust, unrighteous world that grieves us, and too often we participate in that. And But our hearts just long for this. And we've seen the start of it. 
the roots of it in the life of Christ as it's reflected in Scripture, and we know uh, by faith what's to come. And there's, I mean, there's another whole track we could go on with this, and Ted touched on it. For us, uh, for to us, this is intended for us still. This is a timeless us. A child is born, for to us a son is given. Christ was just a gift from the Lord to us. And when in, and Ted again highlighted the very end of that, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish it. We can't do it, and we don't need to do it. What we need to do is receive and follow and accept what God in Christ has already done for us and will do for us. And so that's a continuing challenge. All right, if we we're gonna we need to get through uh, we're not even halfway through chapter nine and we have a chapter and a half to go. So <clears throat> the I'm gonna do this next section relatively quickly. Uh, section verses nine eight through ten nineteen. Um, and this is one of those things where okay, here he talked about people who were in this absolutely miserable, decadent, dark, despairing circumstance where everything was horrible and they they would look up at God and curse their king and curse God and then look back at the world around them and despair. And then we had this, but wait a second, there's a promise. There's hope coming, there's light coming. And uh, and this is going to be the the ultimate fulfillment of it. And we just ref reflected briefly on those verses, and then we're back into judgment, because that was the hope of what's ahead, but the reality of Israel and much of Judah at that time was absolutely contrary to the will and the way of God. And so Isaiah, as a prophet, is speaking God's truth and warnings uh, to the people. And uh, one of the key things uh, in this next uh, chapter and a half that keeps being a focus of God as he speaks through the prophet Isaiah uh, is captured in verses 9 and 10. Um, who would read cha uh, chapter 9, verses 9 and 10? All the people shall know, even Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, that say in the pride and stoutness of heart, bricks are falling down, but we will build with hewn. Okay, so what's the core issue here that God uh, is pointing out through Isaiah and that God finds so offensive? Their pride. There, it's pride. It's pride. It says, who say with pride and arrogance of heart. And then this, you know, this, the bricks have fallen down. You know, bricks would decay and break down. They were hand, handmade with clay. But, oh, we're, we're going to replace that with chiseled stone. And it's going to be beautiful. And we're going to do it because we're in charge uh, of our futures. And so God judges over and over their pride and their arrogance. Now, I want us to just, and I, I get the idea that Justin may have touched on this last week, um, but if you do have the book on page 75, there's a really good uh, discussion, and I want to share just a little bit of it in this context. Uh, the promise of a remnant, and we're going to get to the remnant because it comes up in the next chapter. The promise of a remnant was based on the covenant. 
the Lord had made an everlasting treaty, a covenant with Abraham to bless his descendants in the land of Canaan. The Lord swore to be Israel's God and Israel would be his treasured and chosen people. As a faithful and just God, he would never break his covenant. But as a righteous and holy God, he could not be intimate with a corrupt and defiant people. Therefore, only faithful members of the covenant nation were truly God's people. The mass of Israel repeatedly rebelled and was punished, but God consistently spared a remnant. And it's this idea, you know, when we get to these sections, maybe this is just me, but you get to these sections of judgment and the things that God allows. And in this case, God uses the power and the arrogance of the king of Assyria to destroy uh, and oppress much of Israel and to threaten um, parts of Judah all the way up to threatening Jerusalem itself. And when we read these over and over, and we're going to get to it in a minute, but there are like five waves of it in this next chapter and a half. Sometimes I just feel like, wow, God, uh, you know, I love this uh, being the Prince of Peace, the Mighty Counselor, the Everlasting Father. Um, I love the fact that you made a, sent a gift to us of your, your very own son. But all of this judgment and bloodshed and it just, uh, I have trouble holding that together with uh, the God that I love and seek to serve. And I think part of the challenge for us is uh, that we tend to cherry pick. Uh, we, we do actually what the Israelites did. We want God's blessing and provision and help when we need it. And the rest of the time, we're fine, thank you. And God says, I have a covenant with you, and I am a covenant-making, and I am a covenant-keeping God. And you know, this, the way that you keep operating, that doesn't cut it. Because I have made a commitment to you that I will not break. And I have asked of you the only thing that you need to do and only thing actually that you can do to affect your hope for this future, to know this light that's dawned, and that's to be obedient to me, to follow me, to walk in my way, to, to do the things that I've called you to do and not to do the things that I've warned you about because I love you and the ways that you get sucked into the, you know, the, the, the gods and the practices of the Midianites and all that, there's no light there. There's no hope for you there. So if we just can keep reminding ourselves that God is extraordinarily patient with his people, that over and over he extends grace to them, that he invites them, he promises them, he grieves over them. He is a long-suffering, good and gracious God. And these things do not bear witness to anything to the contrary. Because God is not putting under judgment people who have said yes to him and are following in his way. And so uh, it goes through. There's another lesson for me in this. If you look with me, uh, again, chapter 9, the middle of verse 12, 
uh, I think this is not just NIV. Mine says, yet for all this. You see that? If you continue uh, toward the end of verse 17, what do you see there again? Yet for all this. If you look at the middle of verse 21, again in chapter 9, yet for all this. If you go to chapter 10, the middle of verse 4, yet for all this. God, God is allowing this deceitful, disobedient people to be punished. Why? Because he wants them to come back. And I see the same as America. I mean, after 9-11, people were turning to God. And after COVID, yep. people were turning to God. And then yep. they just go back to their same old, same old. And that's exactly what's going on. He allows some form of judgment to come, desiring that his people would come back to him. But they don't. Yet for all this, they still remain disobedient, defiant. And so the next comes. And yet for all this, and it just, I think we need to understand that this grieves the Lord. This, you know, if we don't want to, uh, anyway, it, it breaks his heart that over and over he needs to allow or send judgment on his people because they keep resisting. And he knows there is no hope. There's nothing for them in those ways. So uh, the root, again, uh, is pride. We see that in verse 9 of chapter 9. It's the all the people know it, and they say with pride and arrogance of heart, we're going to do it our way. Um, and so God's hand is still raised. Now I mentioned he uses Assyria in this section, to carry out some of those judgments. But then, once he's done using Assyria, a heathen, God-defying nation and people, then he turns and judges Assyria. And what is the root sin of the Assyrians? What? I heard it. Pride. Pride. Exactly the same thing. It's consistent, which I think is a message to us as well. But if you look at um, chapter 10, verse 12, when the Lord has finished all his work against Mount Zion and Jerusalem, he will say, I will punish the king of Assyria for the willful pride of his heart and the haughty look of his eyes. So that's uh, God is consistently dealing with pride in his people and in the enemies of Israel. Now, we only have a couple minutes left, but I read that section about the covenant and the remnant. And you can see in chapter 10, verse 20, it says, uh, In that day the remnant of Israel, the survivors of the house of Jacob, will no longer rely on him who struck them down. Who is that? The king of Assyria. Yeah. But will truly rely on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Um, and so they turn and follow, follow God. And uh, that truly is... Uh, a promise for us and a warning to us as well that God is faithful to his remnant. And as we are obedient uh, to follow him, then uh, deliverance comes and we know that light and hope that he promised. 
All right, so the, in the rest of this chapter, God deals with the Assyrians. And uh, Isaiah has some very poetic words. I want to just highlight one other section that we just kind of skipped over as we were going the, the yet for all this sections are the first four verses of chapter 10. Who would read uh, those four verses? Woe to them that be free unrighteous and that write grievousness which they have prescribed to set aside the needy from judgment and to take away the right from the poor of my people that widows may their prey, that they may rob the fatherless. And what will you do in the day of visitation and in the desolation which shall come from far? To whom will you flee for help? And where will you leave your glory? Without me they shall bow down under the prisoners, and they shall fall under the slain. Okay, that's good. Stop right there. So again, I would recommend uh, going back to this passage, it's one of many, many, many extremely clear passages of Scripture where God uh, finds most offensive the way people mistreat the poor and the orphans and the widows. And, you know, when I was reading this, I just shuddered inside where, you know, he, there are these people and one of the questions is, how are we a part of it? <laughs> but that deprive the poor of their rights, who withhold justice from the oppressed, who make widows their prey and rob the orphans, the fatherless. He says, what will you do on the day of reckoning? There is going to be a reckoning. What will you do on the day of reckoning when disaster comes? To whom will you run for help? Where will you leave all these riches that you have acquired at the expense of the poor, the fatherless, the widows? Um, uh, nothing will remain for them but to cringe among the captives or fall among the slain. It's just such a profound warning of what God's priorities are. And therefore, what our priorities need to be. So we just have a, a couple minutes left. Um, I would like to just hear what are your takeaways uh, regarding the character, priorities, expectations, or truths about God that have surfaced uh, in chapters 9 and 10 of Isaiah. What's going to be one thing that you're going to take away this week and uh, and reflect on as a result of this discussion. Just two letter word. If my people. Yep. Yeah. Okay. You have deliverance. If you will. Yep. Yeah. If if only they did. Yep. Yeah. So for you, what's what are you gonna yes, Carol? I need to quit getting so upset with this world. It's in God's hands. Mm-hmm. Okay. Hetty? I think for me it's the word pride. Mm -hmm. You know, because sometimes my world is the world. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yep, absolutely. Someone else. Yes, sir. David, I'm uh, 36 years of the Marine Corps. This is one, one tiny world. And I just do this. Mm -hmm. You know, this Bible. Right by my table, so it's just off. Mm -hmm. But God knows people have got to be together mm -hmm. If you know what I mean. I mean yep, I'm yep. Not, I'm not downgrading the government. I'm not oh, no, no, no. I hear it. So, what our challenge is to live our lives before men right. that they might see our good works. And glorify the Father in heaven. Yep. Yep. And as Hetty was saying, to watch our propensity to pride, our desire to prosper, 
in this life and sometimes it can be at the expense of people who are very close to the heart of God. Somebody else, anybody else? What do you take away in terms of your understanding of God about his character, his priorities, or his expectations of you? How much I want to be a part of the remnant. Mm -hmm. You know, as you look around and try and find your place in this world and compare yourself to other people or other groups. Yeah. If I'm a Christian, but I'm not part of the remnant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The remnant that will truly rely on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, that won't be sucked into the conspiracies, that will not fear what people fear, bless you, but have a fear of the Lord. A holy fear, awe, reverence of the Lord, bless you. Uh, let's close with prayer and then we will be able to go and worship this holy and righteous, wonderful God. Uh, I would invite you over this next week to read chapters 11 and 12. We will talk with, about them next week. So Isaiah 11 and 12, if you'd read them through this week. Uh, let's pray. God, we, we thank you for your word. It's amazing to think that almost 3,000 years ago, these words were written under the inspiration of the same Holy Spirit that has been among us this morning, seeking to help us understand and apply uh, this word to be convicted as needed and to be comforted as needed by the same truths that reflect who you are what you have done for us, what you desire for and expect from your people, and the hope that we have of the ultimate reign of the Prince of Peace, the Lord of Lords, our Deliverer, our Redeemer, our Savior. God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for preserving it down through history. Thank you for enabling us to study it together. And we pray that you would imprint it on our hearts and minds, that we might live this week just a little bit more uh, like you would have us live, to bear witness, as we've discussed, to the hope that we have because of Christ that we don't need to live in fear of what the world fears because our present and our future is secure in you. Help us choose in practical ways day by day to be a part of the remnant by your grace and through your strength, we pray.